to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show, built by Par Lumber. When it comes to big or small projects around the home, Tony and Corey have got the know-how and the answers to make your life just a bit easier. Here they are, your Weekend Warriors, Tony and Corey. Hey, welcome to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show built by Par Lumber. I'm Corey Valdez. And I'm Tony Cookston. Thanks for tuning in with us today, your Weekend Warriors. Today, we're, uh, we've are we got a really good topic today. Uh, Tony and I are going to be talking about what makes DIYing, like what makes us successful. We're Absolutely. Give you tips on what makes a successful DIY project or a successful DIY homeowner. So what would you say is the number one trait of a successful DIYer. Ooh, how about, you know what I would say? Preparation. Yes, I agree Absolutely. with that. Absolutely. Front to back, top to bottom, being prepared, in which is very difficult. Yeah. Being prepared for something that you've never done is difficult. I mean, you have to create a lot of things, a timeline, budget, all of those things. Based on something you've never done before. Right. I agree with that. And you know, something that goes along with that in your mind, right? To be mentally prepared, I feel like you need to be confident. You have to have a confidence inside of you that says, I'm going to accomplish this task. And if you have the confidence, then you have the confidence to ask the correct questions. And so when you go forward to become prepared, the confidence will allow you to ask the right questions and get to that point. If you're not confident, then I think you'll always be looking over your shoulder for uh, a relief valve or an escape door. Yeah. No, you make a good point. I mean, you have to have those things, right? Because you never know when you're going to get into a spot where you're over your head and you need help. I understand that. But you you don't want to be looking for that during the preparation process. So have, be having the confidence that you can get to the end result and doing the work to be prepared is going to be two big parts of your success. Well, you know, going along with that is knowing how to get out of a situation. If you're working on a project and you get yourself into a situation, you have to know how to get out of it. And if that means calling the right person or turning to the right professional to maybe even ask questions or just where to go to get that information... That's really big. I mean, Tony and I, you you and I take on so many projects that we've never done before in our lives, but I have full confidence that we can do it. Absolutely. Full I, confidence. I, and here's a big part of my confidence comes from the person that I choose to go through that with me, right? Who's going to be my partner? Who's going to be the person that I'm leaning on to help me when things get tough? Yeah. And I feel like you need to have that for sure. Whether that's somebody that's working alongside you or somebody that you're turning to for advice, um, here's a prime example. Par Lumber Company touts that advice for any given project is free. Advice is free. Come on in and ask us the questions you want to ask us. Talk to us about your project and the information that we have we'll share with you. And that's free. And that is a good partner to have going through a DIY, pro Absolutely. DIY project. Absolutely. But you know what it goes along with that? is a little bit of humility going into a project that you've never done before and having too much confidence can also hurt you, right? Well, sure. I mean, you got to go in there thinking, okay, I'm going to make mistakes. I've never done this before. I'm going to do all the research I can and watch every YouTube video ever made on this subject, yeah. knowing full well that you're still going to make mistakes. It's just going to happen. But you're going to learn from them and you're going to move on and you're going to do and you're going to, you know, finish projects. Yeah. I mean, I've made so many mistakes. I recently made a gigantic mistake when I was fixing my refrigerator. Ooh, believe it or not. Yeah, I want to hear that story. Well, I took it upon myself to fix my refrigerator and I broke apart. <laughs> so let's just, just run through that really quick. Your refrigerator, your freezer, the, re the freezer portion of your refrigerator was was uh, freezing up inside there. Yeah, the right? ice maker. The ice maker was freezing up and clogging with tons of ice and uh, things were freezing that weren't supposed to be freezing. So you did the natural thing. You Googled it. Hey, is this a problem with this refrigerator? Oh, massive problem. And Huge when, recalls, class and action it, lawsuits. And when it happens, how is it fixed? Yeah. And you found a YouTube video that said, hey, this is what I did and it worked for me. 
not only one, I found 200. I mean, this is a huge, huge problem, common problem. Uh, the manufacturer is very, very popular. Uh, they're very good at making smartphones, uh, terrible at making refrigerators. I'm not going to say the manufacturer, <laughs> but you can probably guess. You're not trying to throw anybody under the bus. They're, I get that. Okay. I will, I will never buy another one ever from this manufacturer. But that being said, uh, yeah, the ice maker froze over all the time. All the time we had to defrost this thing. So I get online. I'm looking it up. There's class action lawsuits all over the place. And everybody's like, okay, you can fix it yourself. Here's how. These are the parts you need. So I went online. I'm like, I can do that. That is super, super simple. I've got the correct tools and the skill set to do it. And I did it. Well, unfortunately, pulling the darn thing out of there, I broke a small plastic piece. This little plastic piece in the very back of the ice maker. And it's, I don't know, you would m maybe $2 part. Maybe a two dollar and fifty cent part. Yeah, and you thought no problem. We'll just we'll yeah, just, just replace that. Yeah, I'll just order that part. Oh, okay. Well, guess what? It is not available. Uh oh. It is. They call. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll bleep that out. <laughs> they say that it's a non-serviceable part, and I said, "Well, what am I supposed to do?" And they said, "Buy a new refrigerator." Oh. Can you believe that? That two dollar and fifty cent part became a twenty five hundred dollar part. Can you believe that? It, I, I was shocked and appalled, <laughs> but you know, I mean, these are the life lessons you make. I mean, I could have paid a service person, uh, you know, a refrigerator repair person. I think they wanted about 600 bucks to come replace it. I bought all the parts for about $120 online. Mm -hmm. um, I made, I made a poor choice. You know, I, pro I probably would have been better off paying somebody to come out and fix it. And at least if they broke it, they had been on the hook for it. Right. But, uh, you know, these are just the things I, I've owned up to it. I've made the mistake and, uh, you know, yeah, but it's not DIYing is not all about failure, right? No. Like you're saying, you need to, you need to be prepared to make those mistakes and you need to be patient with yourself and your capability and understand that s during the learning process, during the, uh, becoming a successful DIYer process, you're going to make mistakes and some of those mistakes are going to cost you some money. So you're either choosing to take that path and learn how to be a good DIYer and you're going to take your lumps or you avoid it altogether. Yeah, no, I mean, that's actually the first thing on my list is patience, having patience, learning and understanding from your mistakes and not going, you know, getting all out of whack about it. I mean, there's nothing you can do about a mistake that you've already made. Right. Right. Nothing you can do about it. But learn from it. But learn from it. Well, I tell you what, the patience thing is huge. It's it's huge through all aspects of a DIY project. And we're going to talk about all of those different aspects and every place you need to have patience. It's not just patience with yourself or patience with your own mistakes, but it's going to be patience with other people's timelines, patience with uh, all of those things that go along with a project like that. So we're going to talk about that extensive list of all of those things as we go through the show, and you're going to love it. So stick around when we get back. More th things that will make you a successful DIYer. You're listening to Tony and Corey. Your week and worse. We'll be right back. Tony and Corey here with the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show, built by Par Lumber. Hey, Corey. Hey, what's up, man? Hey, have you seen our new YouTube channel? Um, of course I have. Haven't you subscribed to it yet? Uh, yeah, totally. Is that a yes or a no? Well, I don't really know how, so... Look, it's easy. All you have to do is go to www.homeshow.com and click on the YouTube link. Hit subscribe, and you're good to go. Ah, uh, but my arms are too short. Oh, come on, it's not that hard. I think I got bit by a spider. What? Are you okay? No, yeah, I'm fine. Hey, 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 does my head look big to you? No? You don't think so? Well, whatever. Tune in this weekend, you'll definitely get a laugh, and you'll likely get some good advice, but only if you listen. Hey, welcome back to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show built by Par Lumber. Thanks for staying with us Tenone, today, Tony. 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 Tenone and I are talking about, uh, we're going to give you tips today on how to become a successful DIYer. 
Uh, obviously, making mistakes is pretty common. Sure. You know, Tony and I have had our fair share. I kind of shared a mistake that I made uh, in my, you know, weekend warrior esque escapades. Sure. Uh, what are, you know? What's one of the biggest mistakes you ever did besides sheetrock? Well, I'll tell you what. It comes honestly right. It fits fits right in with the patience. How important it is to have patience because when you make a decision to tackle a DIY project, uh, let's call it a home improvement project, right? That I'm going to do myself. When you have the epiphany that this is something you want to do, you don't want to wait. You want to get after it right away. And uh, God forbid you have the epiphany on a long weekend, like you have (laughs) Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday off, right? And you're thinking, what a great opportunity to get a whole bunch of this project done in this short period of time. I'm going to get up on Thursday morning. Yeah. I'm going to demo out my whole bathroom. And I'll be done by Sunday. Yeah, well, that- you know, that's exactly the thing. You get an adrenaline rush, and you get an excitement, and you're talking to your spouse, and your spouse is egging you on. Let's do it. I've wanted to do this for a long time. There's no time like the present. Is that a dangerous phrase? I think, in yeah, in the DIY world, you know, it there's, is. There's no time like the present. Let's get after it. So what I did, Corey, it was Thanksgiving weekend, and I had taken Friday after Thanksgiving off. So as soon as my house was empty, on, not to go shopping either. on Thursday night after Thanksgiving, as soon as the house was empty, it was on. The hammers came out, the sludge hammers came out, and we started to demo our kitchen. <laughs> that was the decision that we made. We are going to do a kitchen remodel, and it starts right here. Right now. And we started tearing out walls and sheetrock and cabinets, and countertop. And you didn't even have a dumpster. And we didn't even have a dumpster. But, you know, we thought this is a... We had given it thought. We didn't give it no thought. We didn't conceive of the idea necessarily on Thanksgiving Day. We'd we'd talked about it before, but we'd never put a date to it. And we definitely did not create a timeline. We didn't have an idea where we were going to get all of the things we needed to get. We knew we had a budget, some money, But we had not gone line by line to determine what all of the costs were going to be to make sure that we were going to be ahead of the game. We went, we rushed headlong in and we went after it. And I am not going to discount the memories and the the fun times and the the rewarding result. All of those things were amazing. And, And I wouldn't change that. But I definitely could have done some more research ahead of time and been more prepared. For instance, name one example from that experience where you said, this was a mistake. (laughs) We had no countertops in our only kitchen for eight weeks. (laughs) Eight (laughs) long weeks. Now, yeah, that's intense. Had we considered how we were going to operate our daily lives for eight weeks without a kitchen countertop. Well, honestly, we I guess we hadn't thought through it fully because at the end of that eight weeks, we were ready to have a new countertop that we could operate on. We could have done something better. We could have made up a a temporary station or or we could have done better. Maybe we maybe we pulled our camper trailer around and set up our kitchen in the camper trailer. I don't know. There is something we could have done that would have been more responsible. But ultimately, in the end, we did get through that project. We did it under budget. And the result is amazing. And I'm so glad we did it. But uh, we definitely could have been more efficient. And and we could have suffered less. So there's my number one big DIY mistake. I rushed in and I paid the price because it took a lot longer to do than I thought it was going to. So if you wanted to be a successful DIYer, one of the things on my list is to have a vision. Create a plan. And in that plan are a lot of different things, and we'll go through each one. But one of the first ones is to have blueprints, to have some sort of drawing of what you want to accomplish. I know you jumped head first right into that project, demoed it out, and said, all right, Now what? Yeah. I mean, I remember you calling me the next week saying, 
hey, uh, do you know if this wall here is load bearing? <laughs> I mean, yeah. at that point, you had no kitchen. Right. And you were still trying to figure out if a wall was load bearing. Right. So having an idea, having a vision, drawing something out, just just to have something that you can take and take to a professional cabinet maker or take to the Park Cabinet Design Center. This is what I want. You know, because part of that plan is having a budget. How often have you started a project and you said, yeah, I think this is going to cost me about 1500 bucks," And it cost you 1500 bucks. I mean, honestly. Yeah, I, it, it, seems to, slim. it seems to never go that way. Right. Uh, because you generally are hesitant to budget more than you have to spend. Because you always want to spend, uh, you always want to do as much as you can with what you have. So you're maximizing your dollars. And when you do that, you rarely leave, you know, money there for things that you didn't expect. Yeah. yeah. For the unexpected. But that's the thing is if you don't know, you don't know. Right. I mean, for instance, countertops. I mean, you could search countertops till you're blue in the face. They're still going to be around the same price. You know what I mean? You're going to go in there and pay X amount of dollars per square foot if you go to the cheapest countertop place in town or the most expensive. You know, there's a range. And if you don't know what that is, you're not going to know what to budget for. So if you just throw a number out there and say, I think it's about it's going to be about $1,000, not fully knowing that bare minimum is going to be three. Right. You know what I mean? You're, you're doing yourself a disservice, a major disservice. So to be successful... You know, part of that having a vision means creating a budget. And sure, it starts with how much money do you want to spend? How much money do you have? If you want, if you have to take out a home equity loan or are you using your savings? If you have, you know, $20,000 in your savings account and you say, this is it. This is all the money that I have to spend on this project, whatever it is then you better darn well know what things cost. Absolutely. Right? So creating a budget starts with creating a plan. Right. It's very important also to take into consideration all portions of the budget. Here's one. You mentioned it. You said you didn't even have a dumpster. When you're thinking about demo, you're thinking to yourself, well, demo, if I'm doing it myself, is free. That's money I'm not spending, actually. That's money I'm saving because I'm not paying somebody else to do it. Well... If you're replacing everything that's in your kitchen, that means all of the stuff that you're taking out has to go somewhere. And unless you're digging a giant hole in the backyard and burying it, <laughs> you're going to have to have a place to or take having it. having a gigantic bonfire. <laughs> a gigantic building materials bonfire, which, by the way, is not, uh, is not favor, favorable. <laughs> Uh, nobody, nobody uh, is telling you it's okay to do that. Yeah, you don't want to be burning particle board. Uh, right. Trust Tony. So, so that's something. That's something right there. That is the first thing you have to think about. The money that you're spending is not just the money you're spending on the materials you're buying. It's the money you're spending on the materials you're getting rid of. Money that you're spending on the tools that you have to rent or buy, and money that you're spending on the labor that you can't do yourself. For example, you and I are not installing our own solid surface countertop. When you buy countertop. You pay an installer to install it. Oh, yeah. That is one of the things that a DIYer generally doesn't do. You probably... <laughs> it's, kind you of like, it's kind of like electrical and plumbing. Another a couple of things. It's kind of like sheetrock. You know, you could tackle those things, but without the proper expertise or the proper training, it's just not going to pay to try to do those things yourself. Some things need to be done by a professional. And knowing what the labor cost is going to be for that is important. We're going to cover more of this and that when we come back and listen to Tony and Corey, your weekend warriors. Don't go away. Hey, welcome back to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show. Thanks for staying with us. If you haven't already, go check out our Facebook and YouTube and Instagram pages. Uh, we're on Facebook and Instagram at WW Home Show. Uh, or if you can go check out our uh, YouTube channel, we're video podcasting this on there right now. So, uh, yeah, feel free to go check that out. Hit subscribe. Uh, if you have any questions, you can leave comments there. Or you can email us at the Weekend Warriors. No, it's just Weekend Warriors at par.com. Uh, or if you go to par.com and click on the Weekend Warriors link, 
uh, all of Tony and his information is right there as well. So today in the show, we're giving you tips uh, to make you a successful DIYer. Uh, before the break, we were talking a little bit about having a vision, creating a plan. And in that plan is a lot of different things. You know, budget is one of them. We talked a little bit about budget, but also having blueprints. Putting your vision down on paper is the really the first part. You know, you have to fully understand what the scope of your work is before you can create a budget or create a timeline or figure out if you need to get permits or have it engineered. You know, one of the things in Tony's kitchen project, he wanted to remove a wall. Well, it turned out that that was a load bearing wall. Not the end of the world. You can certainly put a beam in there and we could have moved around that. You could have gotten rid of that wall, uh, but then you're now you're talking, you're so much more money. Oh yeah, you're talking about getting so much more drawings. Time. You get yeah. about engineering. You got to take it to the city. You got to get it, you know, permitted and all yep. that. So lots of structural changes there. Yeah, if you're, it just depends on the scope of your budget. I mean, it really starts with how much money do you have that you want to start with. Right. You know, if that's where you're going to start, is I have this amount of money and that's it. Or are you trying to calculate a budget so you can go to the bank and take out a loan? Right. Really, it all it all kind of goes together. But without having that and sitting down and spending the time before you start swinging the hammer, you know, you could end up in a little bit of trouble. Right. You could be 10 weeks in. You could be six oh, months in. I didn't think and, about that. And, and not have enough money to pay for the last few things. I mean, I see that all the time. You know, you know, Tony and I work at Par Lumber Company. I'm a contractor salesperson. I ship lumber to houses all the time. And typically what happens is people have these, you know, visions of grandeur. They come in, they say, I want this enormous, gigantic house. And they get to the end and they say, man, what are the cheapest windows I can buy? Yeah. You know, what's the cheapest roofing I can put on this house? What's the least expensive siding? And it's like, is is that really what you want to do? Do you want to get to that point where you've spent so much money on everything else? You get to the very most important things and say, I want the cheapest thing I can get because I'm out of money. Yeah. You know, so not running into that situation to me is one of the most important. What is something else, Tony? <laughs> I mean, Boy. design. we're talking about design, too. Yeah. You know, you get in there. You've made this plan. And having a design, you know, not knowing, like when we went tile shopping for our kitchen remodel, and I'm sure you experienced the same thing. You can go in and go tile shopping and spend 30 cents a square foot. I mean, up to $50 a square foot for tile. Right. Same thing goes for hardwood floors. Everything has that kind of capacity. You know, you can pick out two different sinks that look almost identical, but one of them is eighteen hundred dollars and one of them is three hundred right you know so not knowing that stuff ahead of time and understanding the differences in my opinion i think you really need to pick out almost everything you need to make those decisions maybe not the wall paint color but knowing you know okay paint is forty dollars a gallon and i'm going to need about five you know that is what that's that line item is going to cost me that amount of money but having an allowance for yourself knowing that tile is in between 50 cents a square foot and 50, you know, knowing on that slide rule where you're going to end up, you know, I want to splurge a little. So I want to go $20 or $30 a square foot on tile. Mm -hmm. But without making those decisions ahead of time, I think you're, you're starting off on the wrong foot. So here's the next part of that is a reading between the lines. You said paint, I need 20 gallons. That's this much per five gallon Boom, that's a budget line item. No, it's not. You got to have primer. You got to have paintbrushes. You got to have pans. You got to have rollers. You got to have roller covers. You got to drop cloths. Edgers, drop cloths. Tape if you're me, not if you're Corey. You got to have a <laughs> you got to have a brush that cuts in uh, if you're Corey. You see what I'm saying? There's a lot of things that go in between the lines on the paint thing. Uh, and so you have to make those decisions. And then of course, on top of that, your paint could be the most expensive premium paint or the most inexpensive paint. How many coats is it going to take for this product to cover? How many coats is it going to take for this product to cover? All of those things. Reading between the lines in every portion of the project 
is so important. It's not just about the thing, but it's about all of the stuff that surrounds the thing. And sometimes that's where we get stuck. No, you make a good point. I mean, when you're jumping into projects, especially projects that you've never done before, you've never tackled, I've never tackled a full kitchen remodel ever until I did this kitchen. So there were a lot of things that I didn't have, right? But I, you know, I took the time and I really tried to lay out a really good plan. And I did. I actually acquired some tools. I had to rent some tools. I had to borrow some tools. Uh, but I did equate for a lot of those things in my budget. And I actually came in on my kitchen under budget, which yeah. is unbelievable. That's great. Uh, that's, that is a sign of a lot of proper planning. However, having said that, it definitely took you longer Oh yes. To get from the beginning to the end than you thought it was going to. Absolutely. And that was not by fault of yours. That was because anytime you take on a project, there is the unseen or the unexpected. When you knew that you needed to replace the flooring in your floor because it was wet, you didn't know that you would take up the floor and it would be <laughs> undetachable from the subfloor from the subfloor which is literally holding up everything so you had to remove that and then when you removed that even though you didn't want to you discovered more in the crawl space that you didn't also know was more issues you had to deal with so you had so many things that only became discoverable things that you didn't know ahead of time and so what we're telling you is it's important to to consider those things you did do a good job of setting money aside for the unexpected. What you can't fix is the amount of time that that creates. So you can only be patient. Yeah, it, it really does. It goes like back to patience. Yeah. You know, and, and you had on your list, I think at one time you said this, uh, you know, allowing for the unforeseen, you know, not knowing what you don't know until you get in there. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's just a normal way of... Remodeling. Anybody that does any sort of remodeling will tell you, you don't know until you dig into the walls. Right. You know, I can give you, you know, all the professional contractors that I know, they'll say, I'll give you a price, but until I open these walls up, it, it's going to change. Right. You never know what's inside the walls until you get in there. And unfortunately for me, inside of my walls was a can of worms. Yeah. I mean, there was so many problems that I had to contend with after I got in there that it blew my timeline. Right. So, and my, you know, the, the dollar amount, which I did account for, it ate all that up. Right. That sort of slush money that you had set aside for the unforeseen, mm -hmm. which would have been nice to still have in the bank account when it was sure. over, uh, was gone. And, but that's the way those things go. Even though you set a budget and used all of the money that you set aside, your budget was still way under what you would have paid a professional to come in and handle that project from beginning to end. Certainly. You saved a truckload of money and that, and a lot of sweat equity went into that, but it's a successful project in the end. Yes, you spent your entire budget, but you still saved a lot of money from what you would have if you'd have paid somebody else to do it. You're absolutely right, Tony. And I want to share with you one thing, the one thing that the, even the most seasoned contractors, the one mistake that everyone makes. I'll tell you that after the break. Awesome. All right, folks, we're going to take another quick break. When we come back, more tips for becoming a successful DIYer. You're listening to Tony Corey, Your Weekend Warriors. We'll be right back. Hey, everybody. Here's a quick tip for you when you're using extension cords. If you have to plug in one of your tools, uh, a good thing to do is to tie the ends around like that and plug them in. So that way, if you're working with your tool and you get to the end of your extension cord, it just doesn't unplug or if it gets caught on something. So that'll help you uh, stay more productive. Hey, welcome back to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show. Thanks for staying with us to know, to today. Tony and I are giving you tips for becoming a successful DIYer. And uh, before the break, I had thrown out there, I wanted to give you guys a tip that even the most seasoned. successful seasoned contractors make, the mistake that they make the most, and that's not 
thinking about lead times. You know, if you're planning out your project and everybody does this, they go to the store or they get online and they get onto Pinterest or whatever it is and they pick these things out and they're like, I want that, I want that. And they price it, but they forget to ask. How long does it take to get that? How long does it take to get this? And they get to that point. And this is, I, I got sucked into this too. I got burned on this a few times in my projects over the years. You get in there and you say, all right, yeah, I need this. And they say, all right, it'll be here in uh, August. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, S- uh, say what? <laughs> come, come, come again? It just happens. <laughs> Everybody will walk in the door and they say, yeah, yeah, I need this, whatever it may be. And if it's not something that's sitting there on the shelf, it could potentially be several weeks. Yeah. I mean, or a couple months of lead time to get it here. And then not maybe even equating in shipping charges. So asking those questions up front, you know, well, that's one of the things that one of the tips that I like to give people for if they're looking to save money. I'll say, make sure that when whatever you're ordering, if you're talking to whoever that is, a plumbing, lumber, you know, electrician, anything like of that sort, and you pick something out, or if they say, yeah, 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 here's your catalog, pick whatever you want out of it. And they think, well, they don't care. It's just money to them. But mm-hmm. to you, it could potentially be the difference of spending an extra two or three, four hundred dollars on something that's quote unquote special order. Mm-hmm. And anything that's special order typically comes with shipping charges and lead times. So if you're under a, cr- a, a budget or if you're under a time crunch, ask those questions up front. What is in stock? What can I buy today? That's ready to go on the floor. That's typically going to be your least expensive option. And it's going to typically be ready to go. Okay. So the opposite of that is deciding on your products that you're going to use and buying them ahead of time. What are the pitfalls you foresee buying the things that you're going to need going forward ahead of time before you're ready for them? You know, there's not many. I'll tell you what. I mean, there's a lot of projects that I've done that... Buying things ahead of schedule did not be a problem, did not turn into a problem. I'll tell you a couple that could be, for instance, ordering too much. I did a large patio project at my house and I did all the square footage and they would say, oh, you need about 10% extra and you do this and that, you do the math and you get the things. And I got all of these bricks, right? And I ordered them way ahead of schedule. I didn't want any holdups. I wanted no hangups. I had all the guys come over. I had all the rock delivered and the sand delivered. And I was ready to go. These guys worked and worked and worked and worked. And it took them weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. Also, mind you, that I had the bricks sitting out on my driveway for three weeks before they started. And by the time they were done, I was beyond the return policy. Yeah, yeah. So I had a big stack of bricks left over that I could do nothing with because I could not return them. That is certainly a pitfall that you should be aware of. That's actually a pretty good tip for anyone. Ask what the return policy is. I will say a majority of places will have what's called a restock fee. You know, they'll take them back, but they'll say, you know, we, we have to charge a restock fee. That's going to cover the fuel on our truck to come and get it. It's going to cover the people that take it off, that tally it, that put it back into stock. It's not just a a fee that they're like, oh, yeah, we just we whack you for $50. Pad, yeah, pad in their pockets, yeah. It, I mean, it, there's a lot of work that goes into putting that material back on the shelf, sorting it, and make sure that it's resellable to somebody else. Right. So that's what's called. It's called a restock fee, and that's pretty standard mm-hmm. in a lot of industries. Yeah. So ask. Ask up front. What's your restock fee? Or what is my return policy? Some places it's 30 days. I'm going to use one of your projects really quickly on this because this is something that sticks out for me. Buying the project ahead, buying the products ahead of time before you actually, well, before you're actually ready to use it. Sometimes that project could reach a point where it has to be put on hold for maybe reasons um, other than not having the project, the product on hand. You had a large amount of square footage of cedar siding that you had oh, yeah. uh, ahead of time to side this portion of the home. And then you ran into a problem that disallowed you from doing the siding right away. And then that, that product was in your garage. Yeah. And now suddenly you're like, 
I got to put this stuff somewhere else. And finding a place to put a bunk of lumber can be a challenge. Now, you ended up finding a spot outside, which was not in a covered space, but you wrapped it very well. You covered it and protected it, and it went through an entire winter outside. In the rain. I remember betting you, you're going to open that up next spring to do the siding, and it's going to be ruined. And you know what? I ate my words because you bundled it properly. You did a very good job of bagging it and protecting it. Might have lost a little bit on the ends, a little bit, but uh, you did a great job. But that was an unexpected situation where you had this material ahead of time and then suddenly didn't know what to do with it. Yeah, thousands of dollars in cedar, thousands of dollars sitting there on the side of my house throughout the winter. And you worried. I was worried. You worried every day. Is I it did. spoiling? Is it spoiling? And you I don't... made sure that it got airflow through it. Yeah, I mean, you, it was... You can't open it up and check it, you know, in December and make sure it's dry. You got to just leave it buttoned up and cross your fingers and hope you did it right the first time. Yeah, that could be a definitely a pitfall is space. Space. I mean, if you don't have... If you're doing a major remodel you and you don't have somewhere to store all of that stuff, buying it early... Uh, could be a problem. Yep. So maybe ask too. Ask your supplier. Hey, if I buy this, how long will you hold on to it for me? Sometimes it's not a problem. Right. You know, I know like, uh, for instance, carpet. I bought some carpet and they held on it for me for like two months. Mm -hmm. And they're like, yeah, whatever. It's in our warehouse. We have tons of room for the warehouse. But you don't know unless you ask. Yeah. But some products take up a lot of square footage. Right. A lot of real estate. So if you say, hey, can I keep this here for two months? They're like, no. Mm -hmm. You have to take delivery on it within a few days or that's it. So just ask those questions, knowing up front what your timeline looks like, what your lead times look like. It's just going to help you in the long run. I agree. Here's a really, let's move forward. This is a very important um, thought that I had, and I want to get your opinion on it. You and I both agree that becoming successful DIYer, in order to become a successful DIYer, practice makes perfect. Mm -hmm. That means you have to take the plunge at some point and start doing projects. If you're not already a DIYer, but you want to be, you have to start somewhere. Do you start with a kitchen remodel? Probably not. (laughs) Uh, Do you start with reseeding or sodding your lawn? Maybe not, but you have to start somewhere. So what are some tips for somebody or for our listeners out there who are thinking, I really want to get started as a DIYer, but I don't really know how to get started. Really, you have to find that project, whatever it is, and decide I'm getting after it. And maybe you find somebody else in your life who has some more experience who can come and tackle that project with you. I know that I had never installed cabinets when I tackled my kitchen remodel. And I called a contractor who's a friend of mine. He says, I'll come over and coach you. I'll give you some advice, help you lift some stuff. And you know what? We got all those cabinets installed and uh, it was a professional job and it was, I learned a lot. So, you know, I, I just tackled that right with the help of a buddy and you and, uh, and we got through that, but you just have to start somewhere. What's some advice for somebody? That is actually the advice I would get is, uh, calling a friend who has gone through it before, who's potentially willing to help. Hey, will you give me a few hours? You know, hey, can I pick your brain if I get into a spot? You know, hey, can I borrow some tools that I might not have to do the job correctly? There is nothing worse than taking on a DIY project. And By when yourself. you're Well, <laughs> and when you're done, somebody walks in and go, ooh, did you do this yourself? You know, you get that look. <laughs> is it obvious? <laughs> ooh, <laughs> somebody's a DIYer. Yeah. I've walked through houses before where I said, oh, man. Somebody did these floors on a weekend (laughs) and you you just don't want that because a, it's going to take away from the resaleability of your, your home because of that project. Uh, I think in the end, if you're going to tackle any project, it has to be good enough that some it's indistinguishable from a professional job. And if it's not either, you have to be okay with that. You know, maybe it's a room in the basement or maybe it's a shed But if it's in the main portion of your home and everybody's going to be seeing it, I would say that if you get to a point, be prepared to call a contract. Obviously, there are a lot of different types of of home improvement projects that you will want to tackle. We're going to give you some examples of some small ones you can do that won't really hurt if it didn't turn out great. We'll do that as soon as we come back. You're listening to Tony Corey, Your Weekend Warriors. Don't go away.
listening to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show, built by Par Lumber. When it comes to big or small projects around the home, Tony and Corey have got the know-how and the answers to make your life just a bit easier. Now, here's Tony and Corey. Hey, welcome back to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show, built by Par Lumber. I'm Corey Valdez. I'm Tony Cookston. Thanks for staying with us. Today in the show, we've been giving you tips on how to become a successful DIYer. I got to talk about something that goes along with that. Like, for example, we just had this little conversation off the air, and I'm going to share it with everyone. Uh, Corey and I maybe have we we didn't actually get to it. We might have a difference of opinion here, or at least he's trying very hard to see what's going on inside my brain. I said Difficult. to him, I said to him this: doing your own projects, being a DIYer, tackling these things. Obviously, it's rewarding because the result when it's done is something you created, and you get to say, "Hey, that was me. I did that. I'm super proud of it. I love it. All of those things. That's great. That's the result." But for me, the process. The journey, all doing all of the work, getting from point A to point Z, that whole thing for me is more rewarding. And the memories that I created during that time are so much even better than the result that I love taking on the project because the project for me is a blast. Corey's like, no, no, no. It's about the result. Literally, the only reason you did it was because (laughs) you wanted it to be better and not for the journey. I said to Corey, you can't see the forest for the trees. And he's like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Uh, Corey, tell me, do you, are you following what I'm saying? I mean, the journey, man, it's all about the journey. I, I see what you're saying. I get your point. I don't necessarily agree 100% that just doing projects yourself is because it's fun. I mean, I I enjoy doing my own projects because I am a perfectionist. And sometimes I feel like if I don't do it myself, it's not going to get done right. Or if I'm just going to pay somebody to swoop in and do it, I'm always like, ooh, I wouldn't have done it that way. Yeah. That's me, you know. And I feel like I would just rather do it better myself. I mean, honestly, that's just me. And and going through the process is, would I rather pay somebody to get an amazing job done? Sometimes. Absolutely, sometimes. But it's hard to find those contractors, right? It's hard to find those people. Yeah. To come in and do it exactly like you have envisioned in your head. I mean, you know this as well as I do, that I I have vision in my brain that sometimes is very difficult to to verbalize. Okay. To get other people to understand what I'm thinking. Right. Which I draw a lot of pictures. Yeah. And you know this. So I draw pictures to show people and they go, oh, okay, I get it. Sure. But it's hard for me to verbalize and tell somebody what I have going on inside of my head. Yeah. Well, uh, before we went to the break, we were talking about practice makes perfect. And I said, we've got some great ideas for you that will help you to practice some of the things that maybe you want to do going forward. Here's two examples for you. Here's one. A lot of people want to build their own shed. Building a shed is something that people want to do, but it's kind of a tall order uh, for somebody who's never done it before. Here's an example of doing a miniature version of building a shed. Building a doghouse. The cost that goes into building a doghouse is a fraction of what you would spend building a shop. Having said that, the cost of building a shop is a fraction of the money you would spend to pay somebody else to build you a shop or to even go out and buy a pre-built shop and having it delivered to your house, which ultimately in the end will not be exactly what you want because they cut corners on those. You end up with short doors. You can't stand up on the inside. It's never as big as you want it to be and on and on. The door is never wide enough, all of those things. So I said, I suggested to Corey, Hey, what do you think about Telling the listeners if they wanted to build a shop, but they weren't sure whether or not they could take it on, is building a doghouse in the same way that you're going to build a shop, kind of like building a miniature little shop, good practice for tackling a project like building a, a shed or a shop? Absolutely. I mean, the, the principles are all going to be the same. You're going to build walls. You're going to build a roof. 
You're going to put roofing on it. You're going to put siding on it. I mean, it's, it is kind of a miniature house, you know? So you're putting a lot of the same techniques that you would put into building something else into that doghouse. I mean, I've built several sheds in my life and they get better and better and better. I learned from the last one I built, uh, you know, so do, you know, doing those projects. Yeah, definitely is good practice, but I would say, so you don't have a dog. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You could always build a catio. Oh, a catio. You know, yeah. What, you know what a catio is? I do. I absolutely do. I have some do. friends of mine that want us to do a show on how to build a catio. Interesting. <laughs> I think that would be a lot of fun. We should do it. Yeah. I don't have a cat, but we should do it. Yeah. Um, but I was going to say, a good tip maybe if you don't want to put, you know, say, t- say money. You know, say you don't want to spend a couple hundred dollars on materials to build a doghouse. Volunteer. Volunteer for Habitat for Humanity. I'll be honest, the first, my, some of my first experience in framing was with Habitat for Humanity. You know, you sign up, you show up, and you learn a lot. And you're in there, you're hands-on, and the, a lot of times the people that are there on site that volunteer every day know what they're doing. So yeah. you'll pick up a lot of things. That's a really good way to do it. That's a great tip. And you're helping people. Yeah, my, that is an absolutely great tip. I love that. Uh, here's another one: sheetrock, drywall. Uh, here's here's what you're gonna find out about sheetrock. You're gonna try it, and it's gonna look terrible. And you're gonna try to fix it, and it's gonna look worse. And you're gonna try to fix it some more, and it's gonna look even worse. So just call somebody and have them do it for you. Right. This is Corey's <laughs> opinion. Right. But that, that is, is be- that is 100 percent my opinion. That is because Corey hasn't spent a lot of time doing sheetrock work. Drywall is something he chooses not to take on because he doesn't know a lot about it and he doesn't feel like he could do a very good job. Here's the thing. To buy a few two by fours and to buy a sheet of sheetrock and to buy a roll of tape, a bucket, a one gallon bucket of mud and a couple of plastic taping knives. That's and pretty then, inexpensive. And then it's that's very, very inexpensive. I mean, you might be spending 25 bucks. And so when you do that, and then you build a little frame, right? And then you apply the sheetrock. Maybe you put it on in two foot by two foot squares. And then you've got a lot of seams, and you've got tape, and you've got mud, and you get after it. And you do one square at a time. And then the second square will be a little bit better. And the third square will be a little bit better. And you will figure out with a how-to video or a friend that does sheetrock or something like that, you figure out your technique and how to do it. and probably you could get good enough at it to tackle a project of your own, which might be sheetrocking the interior of your garage. For example, a lot of people have garages that do not have sheetrock on the inside. That's a great project. Or sheetrocking the inside of your shed. Another great project. So uh, there's a tip there. I feel like take an opportunity to learn how to do it. But the way to do it is by practicing. And sheetrock, for one, is not super expensive. And I feel like you could do it. I always equate it to like cleaning products. You know, you get in there and they say, test a little corner to make sure that it doesn't ruin your fabric or whatever. (laughs) Yeah, try it out. More tips for becoming a successful DIYer when we get back. You're listening to Tony and Corey. Don't go away. Par Lumber is committed to providing the best customer service. We provide personal service. We're problem solvers. We're positive and courteous. We're competent and professional. We are committed to delivering exceptional service every time. We're appreciative and we care. We are Par Lumber. Hey, welcome back to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show. Thanks for sticking around. Today, Tony and I are giving you tips on how to become a successful DIYer. Would you say, Tony, that you and I are successful DIYers? I would say absolutely, yes. I I consider myself a successful DIYer. Does that make me a contractor? No. It definitely does not. You're a DIYer. That's right. I do not claim to be a contractor. I don't claim to be able to do a job as good as a contractor, but I do a job that's good enough for me, and I am happy with the result of my work. And yes, I am a DIYer. I think... To me, in my scope, 
what I would say makes me a successful DIYer is when somebody walks in to my kitchen that you and I did a majority of the work on, and they say, wow, this is amazing. Nobody could pick apart anything in that room except you and I. Right. We would say, ooh, you know, that little piece over there, it's not so square. Yeah. A little scratch up in that corner. You know, nobody, nobody walks into that room. They, everybody loves it. So to me, that's success. Yeah. I, I remodeled my kitchen. The result was great. I get a lot of feedback about that. Since then, I remodeled my mom and dad's manufactured home. Uh, the whole thing. We took the whole thing down to studs and went all the way back through the whole deal. An absolutely amazing project. And everybody that looks at it, including my mom and dad, of course, love it, love it, love it. And, and I feed off of that. And you're still no good at sheet rock. And I'm still no good so at sheet rock. But I tell you what, um, I at least have attempted it. And practiced, <laughs> and I'm trying to get better. <laughs> I have too, but I'm not trying to get better. <laughs> I gave up. I know you hate that. Uh, let's talk a little bit. We we talked about budget. We talked about not forgetting the small stuff. We talked about adding in fluff. We talked about being prepared for the unexpected. Here's something we didn't talk about. Don't be too cheap. I feel like that there's a fine line between buying the most expensive stuff that's out there and maybe leaving money on the table. Or simply going with the least expensive thing in order to get the project done. You mentioned sometimes you get to the end of the project, you're running out of money. And, and you're, you're looking like, where to cut costs. Yeah, you're like, give me the it cheapest thing. Happens. Making the decision ahead of time on the quality of the product that you're going to use is paramount. And, and you mentioned that. But it's very important not to just use the least expensive thing. Ask questions from the pros. Why? Why is this product better? How is it going to benefit me in the long run? How is it going to improve the resale value of my home? Prime example. Um, let's talk about two different kinds of siding. One that will give you a higher resale value and one that gives you a lower resale value. Lower resale value. Go. T111. Okay. I like that. That's a good choice. It's been used a lot over the years, right? Um, but it's... it's um, it's not necessarily a bad product. No, no, no. We, I didn't say that. Let's explain T1. T111 is a rough sawn plywood with grooves in it that to mimic one by four siding, right? Vertical siding. That's T111. They come in four inch on center, eight inch on center. It's very, very popular. Ve yeah, absolutely. But it, it, it is associated with, at this point, I think it's associated with track homes, which again, uh, overall would probably decrease your resale value in some people's eyes. Some people would look at it and not care at all. Right. Uh, because it does, it is a great product, but it's a single wall which, application. Yeah, what you're fishing for here is that it could potentially reduce your value. It's not definitely not going to increase it. It's a single wall application. Yeah. So not always, but yeah, most of the time, most of the time, um, especially in a track home where they put the T111 on the wall before they stand it. They put the window in the wall before they stand it, and there's nothing between the T111 and the studs, where in a double wall construction, you've got an exterior sheeting for shear, and then lap siding or something on top of that. That is a stronger structure, right? So anyways, we're not taking anything away from T111. We're just saying there's always going to be the less expensive avenue and the more expensive avenue. How about this? Aluminum siding. What do you think about aluminum siding? You know, I don't know a ton about it because I haven't seen very much of it. Would you put it on your house? No. When you have a five-year-old and an eight-year-old running well, around in your backyard? The other question you would ask me is, would I buy a house with aluminum siding? Right. And I would say no. Okay. Because of the very reasons that you just stated. Yeah. Exactly it, it that. Dents. How it about dents. How about vinyl siding? No. I is wouldn't it, do does that. It, vinyl siding looks good. And it sheds water. But you know what? It breaks when it gets hit with a baseball, and it oxidizes, and you know, it changes color, and it deteriorates a little bit with, with the sun. I mean, I've seen this. People bring in a piece of vinyl siding that's 10 or 20 years old, and you're like, man, look at that. Tell you what, the vinyl siding manufacturers right now are like going to murder I'm us. not saying that aluminum siding and vinyl siding are bad, <laughs> and I'm not saying they don't perform. I'm saying there's better options. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, like? And when it comes to... Home inspectors or 
home appraisers and they're coming out and look at your house, you know what they say? They say, oh, hardy lap siding. I like that. That is a product that's going to last for a very long time. Just saying, that's one product, right? So making those decisions based on uh, all of the facts about the product is good. And maybe spending a little bit more money on a product that you know is going to last for a long time because everybody around is telling you it's going to is a good, informed decision. Well, and this goes back to, for instance, you know, going in and talking to the professional about different products. I mean, as a layman looking at certain things, I don't know the difference. I couldn't tell you the difference between, you know, this sink and this sink, right? They look identical. They both have two things. And they're both, you know, <laughs> the same size. And I don't know. I'm looking at them going, I don't know. That one looks okay. Why is that one 1500 and that one's 500 Right. That's exactly you know? it. You ask the question. You ask the questions because they might say, oh, well, that one is special order. And we have to order that in from California, and it takes two weeks, and then you know you got to pay the three hundred dollars shipping fee, and it's you know a seventy second of an inch thicker in material, yeah. you know, and you might look at the two and go, you know what, I'll take that one. Yeah, right. But there are some items. There are definitely some items that you're are worth the money. And that again, that's talking to the professional, saying, I want the best for this project. Okay, we're going to go example number 2. You re-roofed your home. Total cost on that. Off the top of your head, a lot. 10,000. 10,000. Okay. Sure. You re-roofed your home, you paid $10,000. Did you use 3 tab? I did not. Did you have an option to use 3 tab? I, of course I did. And would that have saved you thousands of dollars? Probably. Why did you decide to go with a presidential comp composition roofing? Uh, because I wanted it to last forever. Okay. I didn't want to re-roof my house ever again. It was an informed decision based yeah. on the thickness and the quality and the density and uh, the, the makeup of the product and how it's put together. And it's got a track record. You know that the presidential quality roofing is going to last longer. It's heavier. It's not as susceptible to wind and those things. You made an informed decision and spent more money on that roofing for your home. This is exactly what we're talking about. Just saying... I'll just take the cheapest roofing that's available. You're doing yourself a disservice. Understand. Now, if you say, I know that the presidential roofing is 10000 I know that the three tab is 5000 I feel like the three tab is going to perform as well as I need it to over the next five years while I'm in the house before I sell it. That's an informed decision. You choose to go with the three tab because you're going to turn the house in five years. Great. That's good. Corey decided that he wanted to have this heavier duty product because of the way it performs. He spent the money. And because of that, he raised the price value, the resale value of his home accordingly. Well, and you know, you could also consider that with decking, using something like Trex decking versus using uh, something like cedar decking. Or pressure treated. Or pressure treated. Or untreated dry fur. You know darn well... <laughs> That the dry fur is going to be the cheapest option, and yeah. Trex is going to be a little bit more money. Right. But you're never going to have to worry about maintenance or replacing it, probably for the life of your home. It's all about the informed decision. It comes back to ask the questions, get the answers, and then make the decision. And don't let the dollar make the decision for you. We're going to take a, one more quick break. We'll be right back. You're listening to Tony Corey, your weekend warriors. Don't go Tony and Corey, your weekend warriors, with a great quick tip for you. Corey and I are here building this uh, mobile collapsible workbench, and we were just cutting two by four, inch and a half thick, with his circular saw. Most circular saws come with an adjustable depth cut, and you need to have an inch and a half or two inches to cut through two by four, but we're moving now to three quarters of an inch plywood, and we wanna shallow up the depth of that cut so that that blade is not hanging out there when we're cutting something, potentially interacting with something that's underneath the surface that we're working with. It can be dangerous, and this is a safety measure that you should use every opportunity you get. Thanks for tuning in, folks. We'll catch you next time. Hey, welcome back to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show. Thanks for staying with us. If you haven't already, go check out our Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube channels. Uh, we're on YouTube right now. We're playing our video podcast. 
Uh, click the subscribe button if you like what you see. And uh, at uh, Facebook and Instagram, we're at WW Home Show. Uh, so go check that out. Um, today, Tony and I are talking about tip. We're giving you tips that make that will help make you a successful DIYer. Before we went to the break, we were talking about not being too cheap. But yeah, don't buy the cheapest thing. Right. Make informed decisions about the product you're going to use. But also, don't buy the most expensive things. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you want to, I mean, you can do whatever you want. But sure. as a tip, as a general rule of thumb, I don't walk into somewhere and go, show me the most expensive dishwasher you have, because that's what I want. Right. You know what I mean? Right. I like to say, I like to look at consumer reports and see what has good, uh, you know, reviews. Look, just do your research. There's no reason to put the most expensive, and sometimes there's no reason to put the cheapest. Right. Uh, here's here's a little piece of information, a little, little tip for you. Um, I recently refinanced my home, and... When you refinance your home, you get your home gets appraised, then they tell you what it's worth, then they send you a copy of the appraisal. The appraisal includes the the comps or the comparable homes in your area, sure. sometimes that have sold in the last six months, some of them that are for sale right now. But they go around your area and they, they find homes that are comparable in size, comparable in style, comparable in age, right? And then they determine what those homes are are listed at or for sale for or have sold for recently. And then they compare those to your home. And you think to yourself, well, what does it matter? You know what their homes are worth. I mean, it's really just about my home. And that simply is not true. If you are in a, in a neighborhood with primarily um, moderately priced homes and you want to add a thousand square feet to your 2000 square foot home and make it a 3000 square foot home with a den and a and a studio and uh you know an in-house theater and all of these things then you might be spending money on those things that you won't get back in the resale value because the comps around you don't have those things. And so my home uh, or your home might be the most expensive home in the market. But if the homes around you aren't at or near your home value, your home value could suffer. Did I say that right? No. Yeah. No, you said it absolutely right. Because we've talked about this on the show before. We're talking about cost versus value. The amount of money that you put into your home should be relative to what it's worth. You know, putting in a $50,000 swimming pool into a $150,000 home might not be the most bang for your buck. Yeah. It's just the way it is. It might, you know? might end up costing you $50,000 that you don't get back. <laughs> yeah. And getting $50,000 out of a pool is, uh, uh, in playtime, can be difficult. Well, maybe in Arizona. But, uh, you know, it just it's all up to you, really. I mean, these are your decisions to make. But as a general rule of thumb and as just a tip in general, see what your house is worth and just look at what kind of things you're putting in. I mean, you wouldn't want to put the cheapest countertop you can find in a $1.4 million home. Sure. Because it's going to be a, a big detriment to this resale of value of your home. So, you know, that's yeah. a good tip. It's a good tip. Uh, you want to find that middle ground there. You don't want to be Build too cheap. Build for your neighborhood. You, want, you don't want to be too cheap, but you don't want to overbuild it either. It's about finding that sweet spot where you improve your quality of life without losing big dollars on the resale value. Let's switch gears a bit a little bit because I think a lot of successful DIYers do one thing very well. Mm -hmm. They're resourceful. They go and they buy, you know, used materials or they go and reuse materials that they've already taken out of their home. For instance... If you're remodeling your bathroom and there's nothing wrong with your toilet, it's a great new toilet. It just happens to be in the old bathroom. Well, take it out and then reuse it, reinstall it. You know, in my kitchen remodel, we had a fairly decent stove. It was a gas range. It was a nice stove. You love it. I don't love it, but I'll tell you what, it's better than spending two grand on a new one. <laughs> so we reuse the one that we have and it works fine. Would I have loved a new one? Absolutely. But it just didn't fit in the budget. So these are just the things that you want to look around before you start swinging the hammer. 
reuse, salvage some of those things that you can reuse. Here's a prime example for you. In my kitchen remodel, I pulled down a dozen wall cabs that we were replacing with new wall cabs. I pulled those wall cabs down very carefully, carried them into my garage, and put them right up on the wall above my workbench. Nice. And I pulled out 12 feet, 12 feet worth of base cabs that I carried right out into my garage and put them underneath my workbench. <laughs> nice. And so I was able to move a lot of my kitchen cabinets into my garage, and they are full of paint and tools and stuff right now, and I'm so glad that I did that. Mm, do they really look great in my garage? No, but they were free, and they're doing a job that needed to be done. Yeah. So I absolutely love it. Well, also, along with going uh, in the resourcefulness, uh, consider when you're planning out your project, uh, not demoing what you don't need to demo. Again, if you're in there and you're ripping down sheetrock, and you come across a wall that isn't necessarily doesn't need to be demoed, don't do it. Yeah. Because it's just costing you more money. Right. For instance, I had, we had recently had our uh, bonus room in our house redone. And all of the sheetrock was, looked like it was done by you. And it was, <laughs> it was just really ugly, nice. really bad shape, you know, weird corners, lots of weird mud, you know. And I thought to myself, ugh, I'm going to have to tear all of this out. Well, I called my sheetrock guy and I had him come over and I'm like, okay. Here's the deal. Trying to save money, me being me, I said, look, I'll demo everything out. I'll get the dumpster. I'll tear down all of this sheetrock. And all you got to do is come in here and put all new sheetrock up. And I'm thinking that's the cheapest, best way to do it. And he said, why would you do that? He's like, I can fix all of this sheetrock with mud and texture. He's like, I don't have to tear any of this out. Why would you do that? And I said, well, I just figured you would. Right. So it went from costing me five thousand dollars to about twelve hundred. Yeah, because I didn't have to replace any of that. So it actually worked out really, really well. Getting some advice, talking to some people, saved me a bundle of cash. That is another tip: finding the right contractor that you can communicate with, that has your best interest at heart, that is not just out for a buck. And going to run away. You know what I'm saying? Use somebody that's got some referrals from somebody that said they had a good experience with them and choose that contractor. And that contractor will make it worth your while, just like that drywall contractor did for you by saving you a bunch of money. He could have just said, yep, tear it out and I'll replace it all. But yeah. instead he said, you don't have to do that, Corey. I can save you some money right here. Yeah. So that's another great tip. Finding the right contractor by talking to people who know and getting that advice. Ask those questions. Here's another quick tip for you if you're trying to save some money on a remodel. Don't reinvent the wheel. If you've got uh, plumbing in a certain area or electrical in a certain area, don't just automatically go in there and say, I want to move the sink over there. Yeah. Because I tell you right now, moving plumbing and electrical can be very costly. Yeah. So if you can live within the, uh, the space that you've already have, you know, if your sink is right there and it's in a decent location, you know, moving it a foot or two in one way or the other is not going to be a big deal. But if you want to put in a, a new plumbing drop on the other side of the kitchen, it's going to cost you quite a bit of money. So that's something to keep in mind. And somebody might not necessarily tell you because it's a pretty big job for him. Yeah, absolutely. And I think going along with that is being creative with the space that you have. And that just requires spending the amount of time that needs to be spent to come up with a solid plan. Make sure that what you want to do is the way you want to do it. We got to take a quick break. We'll be right back. You listen to Tony and Corey. Don't go away. Hey, welcome back to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show. Today, we're giving you tips on how to become a successful DIYer. Or Weekend Warrior. Weekend Warrior. So yeah. just to run down, let's kind of real quick, we're talking about having patience. You need to be patient, understanding that sometimes you don't know how to do it. You got to learn. Take a, take a little bit of time. Do your research. Here's one for you. Accept imperfections. Even if you're a perfectionist, 
prepared to accept imperfections. That's very you're, difficult. You're going to ta- tackle some jobs that you're not going to be perfect at, and you're going to have to deal. You're going to have to live with it. Yeah, that's true. Okay, that's true. Uh, also, creating a plan. You know, getting your blueprints, getting your designs, figuring out your lead times, uh, talking to engineers or or getting your permits. These are all the things that you need to do ahead of schedule to create your timeline and most importantly, to create your budget. Yeah. If you're creating a budget based on something that you heard off of a TV show, you're going to be in big trouble. Right. Because nobody, nobody can remodel their bathroom in a weekend on 500 bucks. Find your happy place. doesn't happen. Find your happy place on the products that you're using. Don't be too cheap, but don't overdo it. Don't overbuild. Make sure that you make informed decisions on the products you're going to use because you're going to be living with them and you want to know why you made that choice. Absolutely. All right, so moving on. Some of the most successful DIYers weekend warriors weekend warriors are sometimes afraid to get dirty. Mhm. And to be successful, sometimes you just got to jump in there and tackle it. Yeah. For I'll, instance, yeah. Here's a prime example. Tony and I working on my kitchen. I keep bringing my kitchen up because it was such a huge project for us. Yeah. We tore up the floor, realized that the uh, land, it was standing water. It, well, it was uh, engineered hardwood flooring, mm-hmm. was glued down to particle board. Glued. Mm-hmm. And that particle board was glued and screwed to the subfloor. So we worked at that with chippers crowbars. and sanders and crowbars and flat bars and hammers. It was terrible. We worked at that for days and made hardly no product progress so we made a decision we're like you know what we sell two by six tongue and groove and it's actually pretty inexpensive pretty inexpensive comparatively i said you know what it's worth the 300 bucks let's let's cut it out and we'll just replace it so we cut it out and as we pull it out we found standing water in the crawl lots of standing water like well over a foot of standing water in our crawl space Mm -hmm. And I, I, I didn't know what to do. I really, I just took a step back and said, this is crazy. I cannot believe I've just run into this problem. And you know what? Tony pulled me, pulled me through, picked me up and said, you know what? Let's do this. We're, we're ready. We're willing. We know what we need to do here. We just need to get our hands dirty. So we dug trenches, we dug a hole and we put in a sump pump and we got it done. Yeah, we did. We really got that project done. And I was afraid to even to tackle that thing because it was so big because it, it was so seemed, much work oh it seemed so big i mean we were all decked out in you know bunny suits and eye protection and ear protection and gloves and rubber boots and you name it and we were a mess after we got done with that but we had to just mentally make the decision this is our responsibility and standing here looking at it's not doing us any good we got to get in there and get it done. Yeah. And one success led to the next success, which led to the next success. And the next thing you know, we were like, let's insulate this thing and put it back together. Yeah. And we got to that point. And it was a lot of hard work and a lot of long days and nights. But uh, but we did. We got it done. And that's really what it's about. You have to be able to get dirty. You're uh, going to get... I just want to say one last thing. You're gonna. It's going to happen. You're going to start a project. You're going to get to a point and you're, it's just going to seem overwhelming. And you're not going to know what to do. What you need to do is take a step back and envision the end and what might involve fixing that. Yeah. And ask advice. Go ask the professionals. Talk to different people. And I guarantee you, you're going to be able to work your way through it. Here's one more tip. Uh, Depending on your, your experience level or where you are at on the scale from novice to experienced DIY or weekend warrior, There's always jobs in there that you can take part in. Cleanup, um, digging, uh, uh, you know, packing, carrying. All of those jobs, the things that seem to be, that require the least amount of experience, but the most work physically, those are the dirtiest jobs. So if you're thinking to yourself, well, I could walk around here and clean up the scraps that the contractor is leaving, but what good's that going to do? Guess what? It does a lot of good because if you're not picking it up, you're paying them to do it. Yeah. So the jobs that are no fun, pushing a wheelbarrow, carrying studs, digging holes, or cleaning up scrap, those things will save you money. But you have to be willing to get in and do the hard work, the dirty, 
hard work. So that's a great tip. I actually love that you said that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, the other thing, Tony, is if you want to be successful, get ready to learn. Learning new things is by far the most important thing. And there's a lot of different outlets for learning. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff on YouTube. You know, Tony and I, we have our own YouTube page right now. We're putting all kinds of stuff on there. There's, you can always ask questions to us. Uh, there's, you can go to any Par Lumber location and ask questions. Yeah, you can, you know, watch TV, you can read books. I like to soak up as much of that information as possible and just read about it and watch it. I really enjoy it. And if I've never done it, I kind of get us uh, by watching YouTube videos and watching shows and just learning about it. I kind of get an idea of what it's going to take to do it. And the more you read about it, the more you um, digest what goes into it from the beginning of the project to the end of the project. During that process, you're gaining confidence in your ability to do it. As you start to be able to envision the project from the beginning to the end, and you can picture yourself doing these things. Where am I going to get that tool? Where am I going to get that product? Uh, how much is it going to cost me? Can I afford it? How am I going to get it to where I got to get it to? How, how's it going to get installed? As you're seeing that all of that you know, in your mind's eye, that is what's taking you to the place where you're ready to pull the trigger and get it started. Yeah. And so that's a big part of this. Um, but I tell you what, Tony, here's another tip. Don't be afraid to admit defeat. If you've gotten to somewhere that you you just can't make your way through it, don't just throw in the towel. Call in a professional. Just get that portion of it. Get you over the hump. You know, get call an electrician. Yeah. Call a plumber. Yeah. Call a sheetrocker. Have them come over, get you over that hump, and then get you back to the things that you know how to do. Know your limit and DIY within it. It's a very good piece of information. It is. It's a very good tip that I got from somebody else. Know your limit and DIY within it. You pilfered that? I did. I stole it, but it's, uh, it's really, really good. I like it a lot. You know, the last thing I want to say is to use the right tools for the job. It's very important to use the right tools for the job. And actually, we should throw out, if you ever have questions about tools, let us know. I own a lot of tools, so I'd be happy to answer those questions. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I agree. I won't loan them out to you. You're always going to be tempted to use the tool you have, even if it's not the tool you should be using. Right. Um, and here's the thing. We're not telling you to rush out and buy all the tools that you need to do the job, right? Ask the questions, find out what you're going to need, and then take the time to see if there's some place you can borrow or rent and if all else fails, buy, right? But there's always somebody out there willing to lend you a tool. There's always a rental place that's renting those. And if you're renting a tool for a day or for a weekend, it's not going to break your budget. Those are, those are things that uh, certainly you could plan for. And, uh, and I'll tell you what, using the right tool for the job, without question, is going to save you time, money, and headache. Yeah, don't tell my wife this, but you know, sometimes I'll start projects because I want a new tool. So. <laughs> well, I believe that, and I'm pretty sure she knows it. <laughs> uh, based on the amount of tools you have, honey, in your arsenal, I need a table saw. I'm sure she knows it. Um, but it's absolutely sometimes the funnest thing. And the best place to get your practice for home improvement projects is home maintenance Ooh, projects. Ooh, that's a great tip. You need to be as a homeowner able to maintain your own home in all aspects. And you're not going to know what needs to be done unless you're out there looking at it. Get in the crawl space and look at it. Get in the attic and look at it. Get on the outside, walk around the house, look at it. Look at it in the summer. Look at it in the fall. Look at it in the winter. See what's going on around your house and determine where fixes need to be made and start with those. And that will help you get closer to becoming a successful DIYer. And it's just like your car. You, you know, a little light pops on and you know when to change your oil. Or they put a little sticker inside your window that says, hey, you need to replace your oil at 27,482 miles. Yeah. And you know that. But nothing really tells you inside your house. So unless you're engaged, walking around and you see it, it's very important. That's all the time we got. Thanks so much for tuning in, folks. Have an amazing week. And we will see you next week. This has been another episode of Your Weekend Warriors right here. The Weekend Warriors Radio Network. We'll see you next time.